It is a fair assumption that each of us first learned about color at a very young age. The primary colors are red, blue, and yellow. Red and blue make purple, yellow and blue make green, and red and yellow make orange. This is a subtractive color system. The white paper scatters all light in all directions. We place a pigment on the paper to take away some of the white and are left with the color desired. The more colors we blend together, the darker the result. Of course, there is also additive color. Starting with black, or the absence of light, red, green, and blue primaries in the form of lights of varying intensities can be combined together to create a desired color. When the primaries are combined, they produce a color that can be described as existing inside a three-dimensional space, a space defined by varying the amount of light each primary contributes to it. In a previous video, we examined Luma, the video signal that provides the brightness of a scene. If you haven't watched the video on Luma yet, I recommend you do so prior to continuing with this one. Our Luma signal exists inside this 3D space, a grayscale palette stretching from black at the bottom to white at the top like a tent pole of sorts, located in the center of the shape. This was all that was needed for black and white TV, as the picture was made from various shades of gray. In the mid-20th century, it was time for television to move to color. We reached a fork in the road, a fork that happens in technology on a regular basis. Do we advance as far as we can for the sake of technology, or steer our advancements in such a way to save consumers money by not rendering their existing devices completely obsolete? The National Television System Committee in the United States elected to maintain backward compatibility to preserve the usefulness of existing black and white TV sets and channel broadcasts by adding color to the existing signal. To do this, they integrated a color signal called Chroma with Luma to create composite video. This accomplishment still managed to use the same bandwidth for a video inside a channel broadcast. Black and white TV sets would continue to see the Luma signal present in the broadcast and use it to draw the picture to the screen. Color sets would separate chroma from Luma, decode them back into red, green, and blue, and use the three electron beams to draw the image to the screen in color. A single, backward-compatible broadcast. As time moved forward, television became responsible for displaying various forms of home media. Computers and game consoles also entered the home. While many would output audio and video via RF, like what the TV expected for channel broadcasts or cable, others added alternative video output options. Composite video was kept separate from audio instead of pairing the two using a modulated radio frequency. Then, the color and brightness components, chroma and luma, were provided separately. These signals were later standardized in the late 1980s as S-video and typically used a 4-pin connector. Later still, the chroma components were provided separately alongside Luma as component video. RF, composite video, S-video, and component video make up a Luma-based family of consumer analog video output. Each is based on a brightness signal with added color information. Consumer devices that generate rather than store video, such as computers and video game consoles, may also elect to provide an RGB signal. As we move from the top to the bottom of this list of signals, video output quality increases while signal complexity decreases. History would have us start our color journey in the mid-20th century with an RF broadcast by pairing Luma with Chroma and an audio signal. However, I find it is easier to start with RGB, our three primaries, and work backward through time. Our journey therefore begins with RGB and then crosses the bridge into the Luma family territory, with the first stop being component video. RGB is pretty simple. Let's start by examining the three signals on an oscilloscope. We will do this by sending 100% color bars from this Tektronix signal generator. Color bars help us understand how we send primary colors, red, green, and blue, and mix them to create secondary colors, cyan, magenta, and yellow. This should appear as easy as mixing crayons, except we are using light. Any single visible scan line we choose from this screen is the same, regardless of if we take it from the top of the picture or the bottom. Let's view the RGB values for a single line on the scope. I'll pair the TV image with the scope signals and line them up appropriately. Here are the red, green, and blue signals for a single line of video. Left side of the screen is over here, and the right side is over here. CRTs draw an image to the screen from top to bottom and left to right. Time is moving forward as we draw from the left side of the screen to the right side of the screen. All three signals are sent independently and at the same time as they are drawn to the screen together. A sync pulse occurs prior to each line of video, but the sync signal has been omitted from this capture. For more on sync, please see the 525 line analog video episode. 
100% color bars are represented by sending either full strength or nothing at all for each primary. These indicators on the left side point to where each primary contributes nothing. When you see a given signal stretch upward, it reaches full strength. I'll fill in these areas with the appropriate primary color contributing to the color bar signal seen at the top. Let's compare their values to the color bars now that everything is lined up. The first bar is white, so red, green, and blue are all at their maximum. Next is yellow. It is made from red and green, and no amount of blue is used. Next up is cyan. It is made from blue and green, no red. Next is green alone. Next is magenta, made from red and blue, no green. Next is red alone, then blue alone, and finally the absence of all colors, black. This is a pretty simple way to see red, green, and blue work together to form the color bars we see on the screen. So long as there is sufficient bandwidth to transmit image information, no compromises have been made to the original colors. What about component video? Perhaps we should first address its name. RGB is component video, as it is made of red, green, and blue components. S-Video is component video and is made from chroma and luma. Component video, as the name used by consumers, is Y prime PBPR, that is Luma and two color difference components. This particular set of components comes from the analog family of video. What is it exactly? We already know how to form Luma from RGB. How does color enter the picture? When we extracted the brightness information from RGB to form Luma, we used numbers that are believed to best represent how the human eye reacts to the three wavelengths of light, how much each primary contributes to the brightness we perceive. When it comes to brightness, we are most sensitive to green light, are noticeably less sensitive to red, and are not very sensitive to blue. There are a few standards that use different percentages for how much of the total brightness each primary contributes. The coefficients are theoretical and take human vision into account. Regardless of which percentages are used, when the brightest of each color is combined, we reach brightest white. An easier way to see the relationship between the three primaries is to view them in a three-dimensional space like this one. While this is not a model of analog RGB video, it does help illustrate how much brightness each primary contributes. When viewed from the side like this, we can see the brightness levels increasing as they stretch upward. If we look at each primary color alone at the corner on this shape, you can see how they relate to the Luma equation. Blue by itself can only contribute up to approximately 7% of total brightness. Red alone can contribute up to 21%. Green alone can contribute the most, between 71 and 72%. When the colors are combined while at their brightest, they reach the brightest white point, and all legal colors fall somewhere in between. Why focus so much on this three-dimensional space? It relates RGB to Luma. The combined intensity of red, green, and blue reaches a desired color inside this space that also provides a level of brightness, the value of Luma, one dimension out of three. Since we have the value for one dimension, we only need to define a location inside the remaining two-dimensional plane, this is where our chroma components come from. How do we define a value in the remaining 2D plane? It seems like dividing it into four quadrants using two axes with the origin at the center, where our monochrome luma component resides, makes the most sense, but where should the axes go and how do they relate to luma? Returning to the percentages for each primary that forms luma, it stands to reason that the information left over after extracting brightness contains what is needed alongside luma to produce color, to get us back to RGB values, but how much of these leftovers do we need exactly? This 3D space comes together by varying the amounts of red, green, and blue. Increasing their values includes an obvious increase in brightness. We already know our final brightness level and want to move across a two-dimensional slice from this space to specify a color, but without any natural changes in brightness as we move through it. Therefore, any values we specify to traverse this two-dimensional slice should not include brightness information. So, the color difference axes are specified as blue without brightness, red without brightness, and green without brightness. Only two of the three are needed as a third can be derived. Most of green is contained inside the Luma signal, so we send blue without brightness and red without brightness. Now we can divide and conquer this two-dimensional color wheel using the two axes formed from these two color difference components. For simplicity, I will stop saying prime from this point forward, but know that the signals remain nonlinear. R minus Y is here. Positive values extend into a purplish red and negative values into a bluish green. 
The opposing axis for B minus Y is here, positive values appearing inside a purplish blue and negative values inside a greenish yellow. Each axis has both positive and negative values, so the two difference components alone are enough extra information to specify a color, to provide coordinates that pull us away from the center area where grayscale resides. Having these two components with Luma is enough to decode the information back into RGB. At this point, it would seem that specifying a value for each axis and pairing the two with a Luma value would indicate a color. This is fundamentally correct, however the value for each axis is scaled depending on the video signal output desired. Using Luma formed from Rec. 601, the plot for the primary and secondary colors on the B-Y and R-Y axes would look something like this. Red, green, blue, cyan, magenta, yellow. The color wheel appears a bit squished because the minimum and maximum values for each axis are different. B minus Y is plus or minus 0.886 and R minus Y is plus or minus 0.701. The values may appear strange or random, but they make more sense when you think about the percentages used to form Luma. I won't break down the calculations for the colors, but I will provide two examples if you'd like to see them. The number coordinates for the colors match up naturally with the math used in the Luma and color difference components. However, the numbers aren't very convenient, are they? For component video, both axes are scaled, so each fits inside a range spanning from minus 0.5 to plus 0.5. Their designations are PB and PR. There is a bit of math behind the reasons for this, but the most important thing is that the numbers are more convenient for both analog and digital systems and are easier for us to understand, thankfully. The television will know how to do the proper math to decode the color back to RGB. As a bit of trivia, the P in this analog interface stands for parallel and is a term left over from when the Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers attempted and failed to standardize a parallel electrical interface for component analog video. In the end, we found ourselves using red, green, and blue RCA plugs. Plugging them into your television is a simple matter of matching up the colors. One potential mishap could stem from accidentally swapping PR with the right analog audio. If your picture looks weird and your audio has a loud buzz, check your reds. Now back to our color bars, this time rendered from component video. I'll remove the color signals for the moment, leaving just the Luma signal on the oscilloscope, the signal that travels down the green plug. It should look familiar. The bars are progressively darker, so the signal steps downward as we move left to right. I'll add the two color difference components to the scope and we can see what they look like, PB and PR. Now that you know the axes that divide the color wheel, the values sent represent where we are on the color wheel. Let's break it down. PB contains our location on the blue without brightness axis. Positive values extend from this center line upward and negative values from the center line downward. Underneath PB is PR, same story. Positive values this way, negative values that way. Okay, what about the color in these color bars? White doesn't have a color specified. We are still in the center area, so Luma is all that is needed. No reason to stray from the center. Next up is yellow. Now we have our first example of color. To reach yellow, the PB signal goes as far negative as it can, peak negative, as yellow is the furthest left we need to go on that axis. In addition, it is slightly up the PR axis. Therefore, the PR signal goes slightly positive. Yellow isn't as bright as white, so the Luma signal takes a step down. The three together provide yellow. Next to yellow is cyan. Now the PR value swings as low as it can go and PB moves to a healthy positive value, close to a third of the way up our scale. And cyan is not as bright as yellow. Luma decreases once again. At this point, you probably understand the pattern. Both PB and PR are used to indicate the color we want to achieve by each going either positive or negative. And it is much easier to understand when you see each signal as representing an axis on the color wheel. You may have noticed that the complementary colors have opposite values. This is easier to see if we fill in the values for both PB and PR for the pairs. Green and magenta have opposite values. Red and cyan have opposite values, and blue and yellow have opposite values. With the knowledge of how this color wheel ties to the signal sent with component video, the results of removing one or two plugs are predictable. Leaving out both PB and PR leaves just the Luma signal containing brightness information. What if we only plug in PB and leave PR disconnected? The resulting colors can only move left or right across the PB axis. Yellow turns a bit green. 
Cyan is pulled far away from the desired location and lands in a purple zone. We could also plug in PR and leave PB disconnected. Would be red turns into a slightly more saturated version of would be magenta. Finally, we can swap PB and PR. Yellow is normally made of the lowest PB value possible and a slightly positive PR value. It now lands at lowest PR value possible and a slightly positive PB, nearly turning it into cyan. Finally, let's knock out a few other important items. As mentioned earlier, there are different standards for creating Luma. Rec 601 is used with standard definition television and Rec 709 is used with high definition television. In addition, the two standards use different primaries. It is important that the coefficients used to create both the Luma signal and the associated chroma components are the same. The device that receives the signal should use the appropriate math to convert from the appropriate standard where necessary. Reality, of course, has plenty of instances where decoding color using either is considered good enough. For the components used in component video, you may find that some refer to Y prime PBPR as Y, B minus Y, and R minus Y. Others have even called it YUV. Aside from not specifying that Luma is nonlinear by emitting the prime symbol, these components are not the same. You already know that B minus Y and R minus Y are scaled to form Y prime PBPR. The values are not the same. Likewise, YUV is often used as a catch-all term for any component system that uses Luma. Y prime UV does have a place in video, but should not be used as a notation for component video. As for where it is used, that will have to wait. I hope you've enjoyed this introduction to chroma and the examination of the RGB and component video signals. While RGB and Y prime PBPR are different in terms of which signals they carry, they are quite similar in their perceived quality. Each is a high quality form of analog video. Until next time, thanks for watching. Thank you.